October is a month for ghosts, phantoms, and the unexplained. So what better time to discover the ghosts of our past who haunt our present? Today on Warren County Preserves. Welcome to Warren County Preserves. I'm Joan Needham. When you were growing up, was there an old decrepit house in your neighborhood that held spooky tales of ghosts and witches? What is it about old abandoned homes that make them so frightening? Well, I've always believed that if you go into an old house that needs restoration, um, that uh, there are sad spirits. And I believe those the spirits are sad because they're, they're the spirits of the owners that once built what was a grand home. Grand beyond many of our imaginations. And then if you see what many of these houses have become today, you just really feel for them. I feel in the course of restoring these homes, I've actually personally felt that those spirits which, which you walk in there at night and, and, and start working on something that feel sort of dark and mysterious and not particularly uh, inviting change over the course of the restoration. I feel that uh, once the spirits of a house uh, see what your intentions are, they suddenly become, uh, for lack of better words, a friendly spirit, an inviting spirit. During the restoration of a house on State Street, one of the Walker's workmen had a well, let's just say, an interesting experience. When we were working on the, um, the Dr. Barr house, that was a very frightening place. One of our workmen was uh, going up the stairs, uh, a, a stairs that wasn't supposed to be there, that had been added in the 70s, kind of very uh, haphazardly. And he came around the corner, and he came in right face to face, he said, with an old man. And so I, uh, I said, really, what is this? The man just looked at him. So I showed him a picture of, of uh, Dr. Barr, and he said that was him. Workers on Gary and Deborah West's home also experienced several unexplained events when restoring the Farnsworth house in the College Hill neighborhood. We have one case where he was tearing out the old sink that we have in there, and he was dragging it across, and you have construction debris and dirt, and he was driving across the floor and there was dirt and mud and water from coming out of the, the faucets as they drained. He took it outside and he walked back in and he looked down and he saw a single footprint in this, a bare footprint in this uh, dirt and muck that had been created there. And it was a child's footprint. And it scared him so bad that he got his tools again and got out of there that night. And we have then going through the attic What's really amazing, we found this old doll. And the doll has one bare footprint. On the other side, there is a roller skate on the foot. Which, uh, you know, the, the you, you, you try to say, Could, uh, I'm not gonna even go there. But we found this doll, which is a small doll and with a bare foot and a roller skate on the other. And then we just found the single footprint downstairs in the, in the kitchen. So there's that little uh, the intrigue of a, of a mystery there that you could go off in several different directions. The West feels sure that there must be some reasonable explanation for the unexplained events in their home. But perhaps the easiest explanation is the one most fun to contemplate. And it's like Deborah's dad said, Mrs. Farnsworth has lived in that house for 94 years. She's not leaving anytime soon. <laughs> Not all spirits come with the house, so to speak. Some may be invited. Sharon Dolly, innkeeper of the Victorian House Bed and Breakfast in Smith's Grove, feels that her unseen guests 
create a relaxed and comforting atmosphere in her home. We belong to the Emmaus community here in Bowling Green, and so we asked them to come out here and do a house blessing, and they did. They anointed the front door and prayed over everyone who would ever walk through that front door. And so when the Emmaus group prayed over this, they prayed that this place would be encamped with angels and that always be watched over. About two months after the house blessing, there was a small wedding here. And the father of the bride set up a tripod with a camera that just took random shots now and then. And the next day he brought me a picture and he said, Sharon, you've got to see this. And in that picture, there's a, an angel. Angels, spirits, and ghosts enliven the dark corners of Bowling Green and Warren County and remind us of the people who came before us. When we return, we'll learn about one of Bowling Green's most interesting residents, whose unique gift is as much of a mystery today as it was back in the early 1900s. Welcome back to Warren County Preserves. Did you know that right here in Bowling Green lived one of the most famous psychics in history? Edgar Cayce has been the subject of over 300 books and his library receives over 10,000 visitors and scholars each year. He may be the most famous psychic in history, but a true understanding of his gift is still a mystery. Edgar Cayce was a, a lot of people call him a clairvoyant, but I'll be honest, that's a, a word he did not like to use about himself. Um, he preferred to be called a medical diagnostician because what he would do is he would go into a, an auto-hypnotic state, which means he induced the hypnosis himself, and then he would be asked about cases, uh, usually people who were ill, uh, sometimes mentally, uh, had mental problems, uh, physically ill, uh, sometimes problems with relationships, and uh, he would begin to talk about the situation and that's where he became famous, to be honest, and that's why most, so many people consulted him in the years that he was alive. Casey came to Bowling Green around 1902 to work in a bookstore. Eventually, he began his family here with his wife, Gertrude, from Hopkinsville, and his son, Hugh Lynn. Uh, he loved Fountain Square. Uh, his, the boarding houses that I'm aware of that he lived in are no longer in existence, but they were always right around the square. And the first one that he lived in, he even wrote to Gertrude talking about how he could set out on the second uh, story porch and feel the breezes coming across Fountain Square. And he loved being able to watch you know, all the activity going around in town at that time. Casey longed to work for himself, so he left the bookstore and opened a photography studio, which he operated for about four and a half years until it burned down for the second and last time. Some of the photographs that we have are just excellent. I mean, it, it shows that he had more than just an ability to take the photograph, but he tries to create sort of an aura in his photographs. You know, he does a lot of shading and, and, uh, and, and does some things that photographers do with painting in the background, uh, but using black, black and white only. Uh, so he was very talented and knew what he was doing. Uh, and he did do a couple of um, photo, uh, postcards, uh, real photo postcards of Bowling Green, some of the first ones in our community. I believe the first postcards here around 1900. Casey was what you might call a true Renaissance man, a man of many talents, among them a flair for inventions. While in Bowling Green, he invented a game that is still on the market today. While he was at the boarding houses where he lived before he got married, he'd always heard these doctors, these physicians that roomed in the same house that he did, about the commodities exchanges and, you know, cornering the market on wheat or uh, pork bellies or whatever, and he decided that, uh, you know, he might could make a game out of that. And so he created this set of cards uh, dealing with cornering the market and being able to get rich quick. And he called it Pitt, or the Board of Trade. And so some people uh, enjoyed it so much that they had special decks printed here in Bowling Green to pass out to YMCA members. 
And then someone encouraged him to send it off to a game company. And so he did. He sent it to Parker and Brothers in uh, Salem, Massachusetts. And they sent back a $6 check along with some complimentary sets of the cards that they had printed. And uh, that pit, or the Board of Trade, is still being sold today. And here he invented it while he was here in Bowling Green. Casey had a gift for inventing, but it was his ability to psychically diagnose medical problems that made him famous. And Casey did not have to have the person right next to him or even in the next room. He would always say, I see the body, and then he would see a flash of light. And if, if this did not happen, uh, he would just get up and say, you know, we cannot perform the reading today. He would, uh, if he had a necktie on, he would loosen his necktie, he would loosen his shoes, uh, his, the strings on his shoes, and he would lay down. And then he would put himself in this auto-hypnotic state, and he would say, I see the body, and then see this flash of light. Many people naturally questioned whether his gift was genuine or not. One of his most famous readings took place here in Bowling Green, when a group of physicians used case studies to test his ability. Uh, the meeting kind of got out of hand because he was in a hypnotic state and, you know, did not feel anything or, um, you know, he, he could understand what people were saying and suggesting to him, but didn't feel anything. And so they were going to test that, being physicians as they were. And so they first uh, took a hat pin and ran it in between his cheeks so that it went all the way from one side to the other and he didn't do anything. And they stuck a pin in his foot and in his hand and that didn't do anything. And then the last thing they did, which I imagine was quite painful, they ran a pen knife underneath one of his fingernails and lifted it up uh, and he never did anything. I'm sure when he woke up he was uh, smarting from all of that but he was not aware of it when he was in the, the hypnotic state. And that's probably the best known because there were so many witnesses to it. Now the interesting thing about that is it was also a meeting of the EQB Literary Club. And we've never found the minutes from that meeting uh, when he held that reading. We would love to have those minutes. If anybody knows where they are or uh, has any clues about where they might be, we'd love to have them. Among his more than 14,000 documented readings, at least one of them is reminiscent of his days in Bowling Green. Well, we have a, a copy of one of his readings. This was for a gentleman who was living in California, and I don't think it should be any surprise that a number of his readings were done for people from California. And uh, this man was suffering from some type of skin condition, and he obviously provided some type of information to Casey because he was not with him and his uh, cure is rather uh, telling because this particular reading took place in 1944 and Edgar Casey's cure suggests something from Bowling Green's past because he said you need to get some of the water found at Massey Springs which is in the northwestern part of Warren County. It was a rather popular uh, spa right around the turn of the century. The boats, there was a boat landing there so people could get off. People came from Evansville and Louisville and spent the weekend, sometimes a week in the summer months. And uh, so Casey suggests you get some of this water and use it and it will cure you of this skin problem that you have. And apparently, from what all we know, uh, this man was cured. These documents are important pieces of a puzzle that enlighten us about our past. But wouldn't it be great if we still had some of the other pieces? Like one of the boarding homes where he lived, the bookstore where he worked, his photography studio, or even Massey Springs Spa. If these places still existed, could we feel Casey's spirit the way others have felt spirits? It's something to think about.